Welcome back. For anyone just joining us, my name is Chris Griffin. I am the executive director at the Foreign Policy Initiative. FBI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that makes the case for American leadership and engagement in the world. The theme of this year's forum, which is FBI's fifth, is Will America Lead? Our next panel, the first of the afternoon, will speak directly to this question, because there's nowhere in the world, perhaps right now, where the question of American leadership is more important than Afghanistan. And what we really want to focus on in this conversation is, as the title says, Afghanistan 2014, what are the stakes? We could not have more expert speakers to address this question. The great challenges that the Afghan people, along with their international and American partners, will face in the coming year than Seth Jones, Frederick Hagen, and Ashley Tellis. This conversation will be moderated by Laura Logan. Ms. Logan is a full-time correspondent for 60 Minutes. She was previously CBS News Chief Foreign, Co Foreign Correspondent, and her award-winning work has included frontline reporting from Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as interviews with former Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf, General John Abizade, and Medal of Honor winner Salvatore Gunta. I want to quickly remind those watching on C-SPAN to please join the conversation using the hashtag FBI Forum. For those in the audience, please submit your questions with the cards on the tables. I'll drop them off in the question box in the center of the room. Thank you again for joining us today. And Laura, please ask you to take over. Welcome, everybody. I think you've had, uh, you've had a long morning already. So we're going to liven it up a little bit on the stage here. You, um, if anyone. If anyone still cares about Afghanistan, I'm assuming that's why you're here and you're going to pay full attention to what these gentlemen have to say. Um, it struck me when I was doing my research and preparation for today that um, what is interesting about the, the panel that you have in front of you is that Afghanistan is well represented and, 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 and each of these individuals have a good knowledge of the situation on the ground there, especially historically over time. Um, everyone has a depth of reporting in the region. But what you also have is, um, you know, it is individuals who are very familiar and specialists in all the issues that are at stake. Seth Jones has worked with uh, Special Operations Command. He has a, a, a very close view of the military strategy. Counterterrorism is one of his expertise, fields of expertise. Um, you also have Dr. Ashley Tellis, who has been a specialist on Asia for years, and particularly India. He can, he can bring in the Indian perspective here because, um, as we had a brief conversation earlier, India has a significant role to play in Afghanistan, and, and it has really not been at the forefront of, of the U.S. strategy in that region over the last decade. And, of course, Dr. Kagan is, Kagan is um, best known for his work in Iraq, although you know, Seth and Dr. Kagan have both uh, been at RAND Corporation. You can read Seth in uh, the New York Times. You can read one of his many books in the Graveyard of Empires and, and others. So um, what you have here today is an opportunity um, to remind ourselves what's at stake in Afghanistan and why the U.S. should care. And um, I was, you know, the first question I was given was to ask what was at stake. But um, I want to put it in, a, I think, a much more pointed way. And that is to say, uh, over the last couple of years, the term war has become unpopular in Washington. Um, in fact, from the CIA to the White House, um, it has been made very clear that even using the term war for war on terror was probably a mistake. And um, I am very conscious of the fact that every other day I get another casualty report from the battlefield in Afghanistan where U.S. soldiers are still dying. And as far as they know, they're still fighting a war. And in that environment, you have an Afghan election that's coming up. You have the United States um, pulling out of Afghanistan to a large degree. And you have a nation that has completely lost interest in what's going on over there and is not given a reason to care by any of its leaders. So I would put to the panel, and we're, we, we picked Seth behind the stage. We picked him to be our first victim. Um, so he's going to begin this conversation. And, um, and I have interviewed him before. I can promise you he's not boring. <laughs> wow, that's a uh, uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'll be brief. And, and then we'll all discuss various aspects. And I think we'll have a, a useful Q&A por uh, portion of this as we get into a lot of issues. Let me just highlight a few things. I think um, if you look at polling data, it's probably worth being upfront about this. 
According to a uh, July poll from 2013, uh, conducted by the Washington Post and ABC News, 28% of Americans believe the war in Afghanistan was worth fighting. Not just is, but was worth fighting. Now that obviously um, differs significantly from October of 2001, the month after the September 11th attacks, when 90% of Americans, 97% of Republicans and 85% of Democrats supported U.S. military action in Afghanistan. So over the following uh, decade plus, we've seen a huge drop in support about whether we should, should have gone there in the first place. Um, I'm going to argue here, might be somewhat controversially, that, uh, that I still strongly will argue as we peer down the future that U.S. Is, uh, has said that it's going to uh, stop combat operations by December 2014. Still not clear what that means. There hasn't been an announcement about the force number is going to look like, if, if at all, uh, the zero option hangs over um, the uh, future U.S. role. But I'm going to argue that several, four major factors should give one pause in exiting Afghanistan. First is, you wouldn't know it by political statements, but first is Al-Qaeda's global leadership today is still located in this region, in the Af Afghanistan, Pakistan weakened, uh, uh, region. It has been weakened by drone strikes, which is, we've seen this week with the Human Rights Watch report and other reports that is a controversial step. It has been weakened, um, but in my view, a civil war or a successful Taliban-led insurgency would almost certainly allow Al-Qaeda back into Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, in more than it is today. I was just there last month along the border, and we'll say up front, uh, there is still a presence of terrorists, including Al-Qaeda fighters, along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Uh, virtually everyone I spoke to that's involved in targeting them, uh, people that I worked with in the past, have said uh, they will be there after 2014. In fact, a concern in some areas of the East with an organization called the Haqqani Network is, uh, is that they may be there in larger numbers. So point one is that the global leadership is still there. And, uh, and there are a number of, of uh, Sunni jihadist groups in this region uh, that are not going away. Some of, one, some of them, including the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan, uh, put an SUV in Times Square. So another Lashkar-e Taiba, which is also fighting in Afghanistan, um, uh, conducted a major terrorist attack in Mumbai. So my first point is there's still a terrorism issue. Second. A civil war or a successful Taliban-led insurgency would deal, in my view, a severe blow to human rights, including women's rights in this region. Um, the Taliban remain deeply opposed to women's rights and would like, likely reverse progress in a country that has experienced an extraordinary improvement in the number of female business owners, government officials, primary, secondary, and university students. I think you'd, you'd see a major uh, backlash. Third, a burgeoning war in this region uh, would likely increase instability uh, with India, Pakistan, <coughs> Iran, and Russia, all of which, and I'm going to add China to this, either have nuclear weapons or, at least with the Iranian case, have a nuclear program. Uh, so there's a concern about regional instability, particularly between Pakistan and India. And finally, let me just conclude by saying a U.S. exit from this country will likely foster a perception about U.S. reliability. And when you look at Al-Qaeda statements recently, I'm going to leave you with one final thought. An American exit from Afghanistan, we've already seen this in the jihadist networks, if it were to happen, it's not necessarily clear, would likely be viewed and would be trumpeted by extremist groups, including Al-Qaeda, as their most important victory since the departure of Soviet forces from Afghanistan in 1989. That is a very, very, very dangerous legacy that we have to think very carefully about. Now, we could talk about how to proceed later, but let me just leave you with that thought. Okay, Dr. Tellis, you are, you're nodding your head at a few points there, and I know that the nuclear issue is one that you've spent a lot of time on. So, can you take the floor? Sure, I'd be happy to start by actually emphasizing a point that Seth just made. 
which is that the American and international project in Afghanistan over the last several years has actually been far more successful than people give either us or the Afghans credit for. Remember, this is a country that went through several decades of violent war, where every state and societal institution was essentially destroyed. And when you look at Afghanistan today, what you actually have is a constitutional regime of the kind that was simply impossible to conceive at the high tide of Soviet occupation and in the painful years that went after. So you're now looking at a country that actually has the potential to build on a structure that, if improved and if invested in, can actually provide more opportunities for all Afghans, including those who are currently opposing the state. So just recognizing that this has been a fundamental success in terms of an ability to put in place a structure where all you had before was an anarchy is but something Tenz, that you cannot overlook. I would just interrupt you there to say that Americans don't care about that because their leaders keep telling them that the Afghans are corrupt and dishonest, unreliable, that Karzai is an unreliable partner, and they're never given a reason to believe in anything that the U.S. has achieved in Afghanistan. Well, I think the facts refute that on the face of it. As Seth pointed out, Development <clears throat> indicators in <throat> Afghanistan today are better than they've been in a long time. And the simple reality is corruption is endemic to all third world societies. Afghanistan is by no means either particularly egregious or particularly unique. The question is not whether one needs to bail out of Afghanistan because it has the maladies of an underdeveloped state, but whether we can persist consistently in Afghanistan not necessarily for the sake of the Afghans alone, but because it fundamentally comports with our own interests. And what are those interests? Those interests come back to the same interests that we went into Afghanistan to begin with in 2001. And that is, there is still an unresolved security problem in Afghanistan that directly affects the well-being of the American people and those of our allies. So is there anyone on this panel who would disagree with that, Dr. Kagan? Not me, for sure. Um, <clears throat> I think that as we, as we think about Afghanistan and why it matters, um, there is a tendency to treat it in isolation, to uh, have this discussion as though the discussion we were having is whether we should put troops into Afghanistan or not. Um, and when people say it's not worth it for us to be there, why should we go into Afghanistan when we're not going into Yemen or any of the other places where there's Al Qaeda? Um, the problem is that you start from reality where you actually are. And the reality where we actually are is that we have been in Afghanistan and we have made an enormous sacrifice, an enormous effort in Afghanistan. And as Ashley said, quite rightly, um, we've made an enormous amount of progress. There is an Afghan national security force that is getting after our enemies. And they are getting after our enemies. They are the, the people that the Afghan National Security Force is taking it to are Al Qaeda and their allies. Um, they're doing that increasingly, but <clears throat> they will not be ready uh, in 2014 to take over that responsibility without any American assistance because they weren't designed to be ready in 2014 for that role, any more than the Iraqi security forces were designed to be ready in 2012 to take over responsibility for Iraq without any These assistance. These are domestic political deadlines. These domestic are American, American, These are, American well, political deadlines. Well, in the case of Iraq, it was a little more complicated. There was a negotiated uh, deadline with the Iraqis that originated with us, but it was a negotiated deadline with the Iraqis. In the case of Afghanistan, it also originated with us, but it's become an international uh, deadline that the Afghans hold us to. But yes, they're arbitrary deadlines, and they weren't tied to uh, the situation on the ground. Um, and I bring up Iraq here recognizing how painful a topic it is, um, but just because something's painful doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it if it's important. And it is very important because as people are talking about the zero option in Afghanistan and the path to zero, the model for that is Iraq. And the line that you largely get out of the administration uh, leakers who talk about this stuff is that, well, Iraq worked out pretty well, so there's no reason why we shouldn't do that in Afghanistan. And the problem is that Iraq is a catastrophe, which has also gone unreported. And you have now an Al Qaeda in Iraq franchise that is back to the, le it's the level of car bombing that it was conducting at the height of the surge in 2007 before the violence came down. 
That has all happened since American forces withdrew. And the administration's line is that's not really al-Qaeda and we don't need to worry about it. And besides that, it's in a place called Iraq and we don't believe in that. It's not really al-Qaeda even though they call themselves al-Qaeda and they <laughs> believe in al-Qaeda and they fly the flag of al-Qaeda and they yes. fight for al-Qaeda. They release statements in the name of al-Qaeda. Exactly. And they have, <clears throat> they set up as Islamic emirates and they fly uh, al-Qaeda flags and they have foreign fighters. So we'll just leaders. ignore everything they have to say about right. who they are. Exactly. And everything we know about who they actually are. Um, because what the administration is trying to do, and this is a very, very important point, I think, what the administration is trying to do is to define the threat from al-Qaeda down to be only those individuals who were actually either involved in the 9-11 attacks or part of the organization at the time of the 9-11 attacks. And if you want a picture in the White House somewhere, a poster that has the faces of all of those people on it with X's crossed through the ones we've taken down, with, at the bottom, done, when we've gotten through it, I think that's pretty much what administration strategy is. The problem is that the world has changed since 9-11, and al-Qaeda has changed since 9-11, although in some important respects, it hasn't, of course. Well, I would say to you that, for example, that's not even good enough, because you have people, you know, like Sufyan Ben Kumu, who was uh, a Guantanamo Bay detainee, who's been with Osama bin Laden since the 80s, who drove, who worked for him in Sudan, who went with him from Afghanistan to Sudan, back to Afghanistan. And when he was handed over back to the Libyans, he was released by Gaddafi for the revolution. He founded Ansar al-Sharia in Derna in the east of Libya, and we no longer call him al-Qaeda. <laughs> right. He's one of the original al-Qaeda members, but we want to now say he's an affiliate or a linked group or some kind of associated group. So even having, you know, al-Qaeda pedigree that goes back 30, 40 years, isn't enough to still get you called Al-Qaeda today in Washington. Right. And, so, and we spend too much of our time thinking about who is currently planning to attack the United States, and not enough time thinking about what capabilities does the global Al-Qaeda movement have to attack the United States over the long term, and what are we doing to address those capabilities? And the spread of that ideology. And the spread of it. So, okay, let's bring it back to Afghanistan. Seth, I want to uh, put two things to you in regard to Afghanistan. I think you and I were both there from the beginning. And we remember what people today in America seem to have forgotten, which is the promises the United States made mm. when they came into Afghanistan. And to me, this is a very important point because it speaks to integrity and honor and loyalty and, um, and the nature of being a good ally. And this was raised a little bit by you. The reason I find it so significant is that I think when we think of the United States and what it's meant to stand for and represent, um, it's very hard to look Afghans in the eye today and say that we are honorable people who keep our word because we've lost interest in keeping our word. And we've successfully blamed the Afghans for that domestically in the United States, but the Afghans are not fooled just because you wear, you know, dish you know, sort of traditional robes and you don't speak any English and you live in a, a mud compound doesn't mean you don't get it. You know when you've been betrayed or let down. And that is pretty much how a large majority of Afghans feel, which only makes Americans more resentful because they think, oh, all that blood, all that treasure, how did we end up in this position where Afghans feel betrayed and we feel that we wasted our effort? Well, it's a very good point. Um, the U.S. has promised much and it has given much. It has given both treasure and blood. We can talk about how well it was used and, and what the right strategies were. I mean, I'll be the first one to say big mistakes were made over that time period. But we looked Afghans in the eye in 2001 and said, we will be committed to reducing, if not eliminating, terrorist groups operating from this region, and we will stay until that uh, objective is met. What we've now said is, sure that objective hasn't been met, but we're still leaving anyway. And the blame has largely been placed then on the Karzai government. Now, I'll, I'll also say very bluntly that uh, there have been massive corruption problems within the government, as, as there have been in any government in South Asia. There have been challenges with building uh, national security apparatus. There have been uh, corruption problems in the U.S. dealing with uh, contracts in Afghanistan. Uh, but I would say, first and foremost, not just to the, um, the Afghan people, but can we look the American people in the eye and say that we have um, 
reached a point in Afghanistan where the American homeland is safe for now and in the foreseeable future. And I think the evidence, uh, as I have spoken to operators on the ground from the region last month, suggests no, not at all. Uh, there are foreign fighters that are continuing to come into camps in the region. There is still some active plotting. And the leader of this organization, Ayman al-Zawahri, is still headquartered in this area. So this organization is not dead by any means. Or decimated. Or decimated. It is not on the verge of strategic defeat, uh, as, as some would argue. Okay, Fred's going to follow up on that, and then Ashley, I'll come back to you, okay? Uh, yeah, I mean, on the contrary, if you look at any uh, portrayal of where Al-Qaeda is today globally, it, is, it has a much larger footprint and a much more um, advanced organization now than it did in 2001, and also than it did in 2009. Um, it's, it's in, it is absolutely unjustifiable to talk about this organization as having been decimated. But I want to just follow up on the issue of betraying the Afghan people because it's very important. That's not just a question of American honor, although I think that is very important. Nor is it just a question of, of will other people believe in us, which is also, especially after the Syria debacle, extremely important. And Egypt. And Egypt and many, many other things, um, and probably Iran. But it is very important for a practical reason. What is Al-Qaeda? Al-Qaeda is not just a terrorist organization. It sees itself as the vanguard of an insurgency in the Muslim world. It's a political revolutionary movement. That's right. And what is our ideal end state? Our ideal end state is that the Muslim world defeat this insurgency, not only reject it, but defeat it. In order for that to happen, we need people in Muslim countries where there are Al-Qaeda to stand up and fight against Al-Qaeda. They have done that in Iraq, and they have done that in Afghanistan. And I know that Seth and I, anyway, and I don't know about Ashley, have been on the ground and spoken with Iraqis and Afghans standing up to fight against al-Qaeda who look us in the eye and say, are you going to be there with us when these guys come back and try to kill our families? And the fact that in Iraq, the answer has been heck no, and that we're now having a discussion in Afghanistan about going to zero, which would make the answer no undermines the best possible outcome we could have in this struggle, which is Muslim people rising up against this hateful ideology on their own. So, Ashley, just before I come to you, Seth, a man you and I both know, Amrullah Saleh, the former spy chief of Afghanistan, told me years ago when I asked him when it was the first signs of America withdrawing were, were in the air, and I asked him about that. And he said to me, he said, Afghanistan is a small, poor third world nation. We do not have any illusions about who we are. And we do not think for one moment that we can influence the United States. He said, but I will tell you this. I was fighting these people long before you came to my country. These mountains were here before you. These rivers were here. And they will continue to flow after you have gone. He said, Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban, Osama bin Laden, these are truly forces of darkness and they cannot engender a vision for this world. So I will be fighting whether or not you are here. And I, I found that to be true then and, and true today. And what I love about it is that this articulate Afghan man who was the conduit for all intelligence on Al-Qaeda during 2001 um, put it so perfectly. The Afghans were fighting Al-Qaeda long before the US was in battle with Al-Qaeda. And now we look at the Afghans and say, you're on your own kind of thing. I mean, the, I spoke just this morning to someone on the ground in Kabul, and the sense that I have from the, the John Kerry Karzai negotiations is that neither of them are particularly committed to this agreement that they've come up with. And that's not good for Afghanistan, and it's not good for the U.S. Ashley, can you pick up on that, please? I think it's very important to recognize one simple fact. We cannot afford to let al-Qaeda and jihadist Islam more generally enjoy another victory over a superpower. I think there are many jihadists in Afghanistan and around the world who believe that they successfully confronted the Soviet Union and defeated it. That empowered the movement in ways that have become extremely dangerous for us, not only in South Asia, but worldwide. And we cannot end up leaving the region in a situation where they can draw the same conclusion that now they've defeated the United States as well. That is something that I think we ought to keep in mind as a strategic consequence of the way we manage the transition. There's another point that I want to make. 
getting Afghanistan right does not require overinvestment on the part of the United States. It's very important to understand that what we need to do for success in Afghanistan does not require us to bankrupt the United States. It does not require an open-ended, uncontrolled commitment of resources. Which is unpopular with the American Which is people. unpopular and which is unnecessary given the gains that have been made in the last several years. What it does require is a responsibility, a consistency of leadership, and a willingness to hold out support until Afghanistan can make the transition to being independent. So how the, long is that? How long are you talking? It is extremely hard to make that judgment our priority, but we have to be committed to the principle that as long as the Afghans are willing to put their foot to the pedal, the United States will stand with them in making this possible. I think this is the, this is the kind of discussion that we ought to have, because in the abstract, discussions about the numbers of troops, discussions about top lines with respect to assistance. These things are unhelpful. What we need to do is essentially assure the Afghans that if they make their contribution, the United States will not be found wanting. And when one actually does the math, you discover that the numbers are actually not as overwhelming as people think. And I hope in the discussion that follows, we'll get a chance to explore this in some depth. So Seth, you're going to follow up on that. I will say some, some people listening to this might think, you guys are crazy. This is done. This is a done deal. We're out of there, right? This administration isn't even going to consider anything other than how fast they can get out. Well, let me just say two things. One is the decision hasn't been reached. Uh, so we don't know. December of 2014 is, in theory, the end of combat operations. But what does that mean? Hasn't been decided. I would say I'm a little bleak on, um, on whether this ad administration is committed to keeping a necessary footprint in Afghanistan. But this brings up an issue that we might actually we, we might uh, disagree on somewhat, uh, which is what should we be doing? Um, and what should the footprint look like? And I'll just briefly state um, these situations are very different, but, but I, I, when I look around the world at where the U.S. has been able to deploy forces, whether it's been in the Philippines or a range of other countries, Philippines after 9-11, um, with a somewhat light footprint supporting local forces, I'm not convinced at this point in the struggle that those, those numbers have to be high. Uh, I, I think the U.S. could remain in Afghanistan with a lethal counterterrorism footprint, that is, uh, Joint Special Operations Command uh, uh, forces, uh, U.S. Special Operations forces and other conventional forces to do basic training, advising, and assisting, and then key what, what you call enablers, that is, air power that can conduct strikes in case there are um, uh, there's pressure by the Taliban or other groups on a city, um, uh, predator and reaper uh, capabilities that can collect intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Uh, I have looked at numbers between eight and 12,000 U.S. forces uh, that really let Afghans do the bulk of the fighting. The U.S. is largely in a supporting role as probably being sufficient. Which I have to point out, the Afghans are willing to do, actually, the bulk of the fight. Well, and they have been. And I mean, Afghans have been taking multiples of the casualties that American or that international forces have been taking for quite some time. They're bleeding in this war, and they're continuing to recruit and stay with their forces. I just want to make one point about the numbers that we talk about, because I, you know, I, we can come to different conclusions about the feasibility of eight or 10 or 12 or 1,000. But that's a, th there is a question about, is this something that we're prepared to say that if the requirement in Afghanistan to achieve the American vital national security interests is 15,000 troops, but the White House only wants to put 12,000 troops in there, is the president actually prepared to say that he is willing to compromise vital American national interests over 3,000 troops? Is that actually a, a rational calculation? Are we prepared to say that I, we will put in <clears throat> 12,375 troops, but not one more, and if we lose, therefore, so be it? Because you either think that we have vital national security interests in Afghanistan, in which case we might be well advised to put in the resources required to achieve them, 
or you don't, in which case we shouldn't be there. So what that reminds me of is General Shinseki saying before the Iraq war that you need 200,000 troops to hold it. That was unpopular politically. He was gone. Um, it also reminds me of General Crystal having to make a recommendation on numbers and being told what his upper limit was before he made his recommendation. So what concerns me about that is political leaders seeking political advice from their military leaders rather than pure military advice, which even if you go back to Vietnam has always been the case but is no less troubling today. Now, we have a question from the audience that, I, that um, was top of the pile and is one of my favorite questions on Afghanistan because it's something that I, I have been blown up on the Afghan-Pakistan border. I have been shot at from the Pakistani side of the border. I pressed President Musharraf on this question several times. In fact, in one of my interviews many years ago, I said to him, General, the CIA says that if you let them operate on Pakistani soil, they can find Osama bin Laden. And he said, Madam, can I say this is bullshit? And I said, you're the president, you can say whatever you like. <laughs> True story. And where was Osama bin Laden found? Well, we don't know the answer to that question. And who found him, by the way? So, Seth, I know this is something you've spent a lot of time on. Um, and it is, uh, it's a question that I think is extremely relevant. President Karzai annoyed a lot of Americans by saying, why are you in my villages? You're in the wrong villages. You should be across the border. And I think when people <coughs> failed to understand about what he was saying is that you and I both know the problem lies in the safe havens in Pakistan, um, and you're not doing anything about it. So this question comes from Peter with the American Enterprise Institute who says, American enemies have complete freedom of movement in Pakistan. We, how can we defeat Al-Qaeda without addressing the question of Pakistan? And you know, as anyone on the Hill will tell you, we can't open up another front in Pakistan, we can't afford another war, blah, blah, blah. But that suggests nothing can be done. What we have in Pakistan today is a failed policy. It was a failed policy under President Bush, and it is a failed policy under President Obama. So who wants to take that one? I can start. <laughs> Look, uh, let me just start with, with what I consider to be the reality, which is uh, the, the war in Afghanistan. That's partly what we're talking about here. There are plenty of Afghan Taliban. There are plenty of uh, individuals in Afghanistan fighting. That said, it is worth noting, very specifically, that the command and control structures for every single insurgent group, every single major insurgent group, Taliban, Haqqani Network, Hezbo Salami, are all on the Pakistan side of the border. Uh, that is where the command and control nodes are. The Taliban's leadership structure, its inner shura, sits in southern Pakistan, in Balochistan. One level down in the organizational structure, you have three regional shuras or committees. One is in Quetta, a second is in Peshawar, a third is in Waziristan, all in Pakistan. So it is worth noting that the, that the borders here are significant. And when you look also at the command and control nodes for Al-Qaeda's global leadership, they also sit on the Pakistan side. So indeed, we spend a lot of time talking about Afghanistan, and there is an Afghan dimension to this that is important. But the command and control nodes for every major insurgent group sit on the other side. Now, I will say with both this administration and the last one, there have been virtually no major efforts, successful efforts, to target the Taliban leadership on the Pakistan side of the border. There are no drone strikes that happen down in Balochistan. There have been virtually no individuals captured down in Balochistan. That is where the Taliban senior leadership is located. If one is to really get serious about this, and one has to take into consideration, A, why has little been done, and B, or two, what are the implications of continuing to do virtually nothing about this? So I can leave this to others to solve, but I, I wanted to get the threat and the reality on the table, which is, this is there is a very serious Pakistan issue here. And, I'm sorry. Can I can I add two? Sure. Can I add two thoughts to that? I think we should at least entertain the hope that Pakistan will recognize that it's in its interest to do more than it has ever done before, for a very simple reason. Now that there is a realistic prospect that the United States might leave. It could end up leaving behind an Afghanistan that becomes a sanctuary 
actually for terrorist groups that are as much anti-Pakistan as they are anti-Afghanistan and anti-United States. So for the first time, Pakistan has to confront a reality that Afghanistan could now begin to feed and funnel terrorist groups that undermine its own interests. Second, we cannot count, however, on Pakistan reaching the right conclusions from this fact. And therefore, I think we need to rethink the character of our relationship with Pakistan. And to my mind, there is no alternative but to make the relationship with Pakistan a lot more contingent on Pakistani behaviors than we have historically done. Now, we can debate the details about how this contingency is to be expressed. But if we have a relationship with Pakistan that in effect conveys to them that no matter what they do, American largesse will flow to Pakistan uninterrupted, then what you've done is you've created a structural situation where they have no incentives to change. So at the very least, the US needs to look at itself and its own policy to think about how, uh, uh, you know, how we might re-engage with Pakistan on this question. Let me end by saying a word about India. Uh, India is deeply concerned that a premature American exit from Afghanistan would end up leaving that country in exactly the way that the Indians faced it in the 90s, which is essentially a cauldron for all kinds of terrorist groups that would move with Pakistani support or without it to attack Indian interests. So the Indians have essentially said that they will do whatever they can to prevent the current dispensation in Pakistan from being overthrown by force. But we've also got to realize certain realities. The Indians do not have the capacity to substitute for the United States. The Indians, therefore, are going to look, like many other allies, at the United States for leadership before they begin to show their hand. And the surest way to lose all the regional allies who might be supportive of Kabul is for the United States to run first to the exit. And so it comes back at the end of the day to consistency of policy and consistency of leadership. And if we fail on that count, we will not, we should not be surprised to find that Afghanistan will lose many of its regional partners as well. Fred, you wanted to follow up. Yeah, I'm, I have to say that I'm less optimistic about uh, Pakistan than I am about Afghanistan. Um, I think that there are things that we can do in Afghanistan to move it in the right direction, and there are forces working in Afghanistan moving it in the right direction. Um, although if we do the wrong things, I think they will be defeated. Uh, Pakistan is an enormously difficult problem. It's a country of 190 million some odd people with uh, approaching 100 nuclear weapons and the largest concentration of terrorist groups anywhere in the world, and it is clearly a problem. My question to people who say, why are we in Afghanistan when Pakistan is the problem is, you have to explain to me how the situation is held by taking a weakened Al-Qaeda and terrorist uh, and Taliban infrastructure in Afghanistan and making it stronger while trying to persuade the Pakistanis to fight the ramifications of that on their side. It's quite true that you can't win this fight on either side of the Durand line, but the corollary is that you can't win it in Pakistan if you lose it in Afghanistan. They are linked in that way, and this is just too often left out of our discussion entirely. One of the reasons to care about Afghanistan is because of Pakistan. And because of Pakistan's nuclear weapons. Yes. So I have a, another question from the audience. This is from Edward Joseph, um, Johns Hopkins, SIS. It was for me. He said, why blame our leaders for not giving us a reason to stay in Afghanistan when it's the media that constantly reports on corruption, green on blue attacks, failure of programs, etc." And I would say we both bear responsibility. Absolutely, without any question, the media is culpable. And um, there, is, there is some good reporting on Afghanistan, not nearly enough, and there's some terrible reporting on Afghanistan. But what I would point out here to you, Edward Joseph, is that the journalists that are writing a lot of this stuff are getting calls from government officials who, by the way, love to leak things when they're the ones doing the leaking, but are very active in going after leakers when they don't like the leaks because they, they counteract the message of the administration. And we apparently like going after journalists for leaks these days too. And, um, and apparently the media doesn't 
seem to raise much of an objection about that either. So there's a lot lacking in the media. I take full responsibility for that. I would say to you, though, I did a piece, you know, not this season, last season, about the return of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and the significance of, of what they were doing and how, you know, for example, after bin Laden was killed, the announcement that came for his replacement came out of Kunar, which was then the de facto headquarters of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. I mean, the evidence is there, and not enough journalists are paying enough attention to it, and, uh, and that is definitely a factor. But the people giving the message, who are deliberately misleading, are the leadership, and that's what I hold them accountable for. Because when we look at the reality on the ground, it's different to the picture that's painted by the leadership. And I think we all have a responsibility, to be honest not just the media and not just the politicians. And the failure of policy is something that we have not addressed well in the media. media. There's a failure of policy in Afghanistan and a failure of policy in Pakistan. And when the, the Afghans ask us what our policy is on Pakistan, we don't, we don't even have one to tell them. Certainly not one that makes any sense or gives them any confidence. And what, we're, we're very quick to hold the military accountable for their failures, as we should be. Um, but no one seems to be as quick to hold the politicians accountable for their failures of policy. So the next question comes from Leon Weintraub, University of Wisconsin. And I think this is a, a fair point that he makes here. With all the signs of progress cited um, by the panel, what percent of the Afghan population is now part of a functioning modern state? We all know there's no percentage of the Afghan population that's part of a functioning modern state, but that's not necessarily the benchmark here of progress. Because I do remember an Afghanistan that didn't have, you know, one pane of glass from the length and breadth of the country. And Kabul today is, um, is, is pretty dramatically different from what it was when I went with the, the Afghans who took it from the Taliban. Uh, the objective is not to establish a modern functional state in Afghanistan, and that has not been the objective for quite a number of years. I had the privilege of uh, serving on General McChrystal's initial assessment review when we had the long conversations about what exactly the objective should be, um, and concluded, and this is what uh, I believe the White House also uh, believed and believes, that the objective is a state in Afghanistan that is regarded as sufficiently legitimate by its people that the nature of the state is not fueling an active insurgency against it. The question is not whether, Afghan, whether Kabul is going to look like Washington or Topeka. The question is whether the Afghan people, for the most part, are going to accept the legitimacy of their government the way most people in most countries around the world, in all countries that don't have insurgencies, do. That's a different standard in different parts of Afghanistan, as you well know. Um, when you go up into capillary valleys in Konar, they don't want any government. And when you try to bring government to them, you have a big problem. In urban centers, it's a very different situation. And I think we've seen some progress. The corruption is important. I don't think we should minimize the corruption. The corruption has been a driver of instability for a variety of reasons and will continue to be. But we're looking for something that will satisfy the Afghan people. And that's what we've been driving toward. And I think that's what the progress has been moving toward, even though we don't recognize it as a kind of state that most Americans would want to live in. One of the things that struck me about spending time, as several of us have, have uh, spent time over the years in Afghanistan, is how, how many s types of states there are within. There's a formal state apparatus that is based out of Kabul, that has ministries. But when you get out of rural areas, what you get is an informal apparatus. I mean, this is not, this is a very different kind of structure. This is not... This is not Bosnia, this is not the Balkans that we spend time in. This, this is not Germany after World War II or Japan after World War II. The state system is very different here. There is a, a limited central government, and when you get into southern Afghanistan, for example, you have Durrani, Pashtun tribes, sub-tribes, clans, power brokers. And, you know, the interesting thing over the first couple of years of the struggle was how, how many resources the U.S. tried to push through the state system uh, including building a court apparatus and judges and things that we think are near and dear to us. When you get out into rural areas, uh, justice is, is, uh, is handed down through an informal um, apparatus. L leaders in a village will adjudicate disputes informally. This is not, this is not the United States. This is not Western-style state apparatus. So, 
part of this issue, I think, we need to be a little careful about what we're trying to construct and what we should construct. And I, I strongly second Fred's point. If I can say one other issue about the media, one of the things that has struck me about the media, um, uh, and, and Laura, you've been a major exception to this, is how little people have actually looked at the other side of the struggle. This is not just about focusing on what's going on within the US, within the Afghan government. And there are problems like there are in, in any, any war. But you, you look at the Taliban side. They've had to establish an accountability commission because there's been corruption within the Taliban. They're involved in the drug trade. They're involved in, uh, in trafficking poppy, in, uh, in, um, in, in targeted assassination. Roughly 75 to 80 percent of the civilians killed are done by the insurgent side. So, you know, it, it, one of the disservices, I think, to the coverage of this war from the media perspective is when issues of corruption come up, um, the focus is on one side. The reality is this is a struggle within and among multiple different organizations, that, and there are just as many, if not more, challenges within the insurgency as there are within the government. Um, Again, everything from corruption to the inability of Taliban forces to read. Um, so when people show me literacy rates among Afghan forces, I say, well, actually interesting to compare. They're actually better than they are on the insurgent side. So you want to talk about comparisons. And I think that's been a bit of a disservice in the way the, the media has covered the war. So, Ashley. I would just make the point that Afghanistan has always been a decentralized state. And any mental model that thinks of Afghanistan as a unitary central state is using the wrong benchmark. The benchmark we ought to be using is a very simple one. For the average Afghan, is, has personal security increased in the everyday circumstances of their lives? Two, has there been a mechanism for dispute resolution and the administration of justice? And three, are ordinary Afghans able to conduct their economic activities without undue interference from the state. I mean, these are the metrics by which you judge progress. And I think as both Fred and Seth said, the picture varies considerably depending on which part of Afghanistan you go to. And our objective has to be to make certain that the portions of Afghanistan that have not established progress on these counts actually begin to grow and develop on the basis of the example set by their more successful neighbors. Okay, so we're starting to run out of time. So this last question, I would like everybody to answer if they can add their point to it. I'm gonna take a question from the audience and, and add to it myself. Um, we have here from Anna, sorry Anna, I'm gonna mess up your last name, but it's, I think it's Mulraney from the Christian Science Monitor, who said, if, as Seth notes, the Al-Qaeda leadership is still along the Afghan-Pakistan border, does this mean the US has lost its decades-long war? And then I think the part that is even more relevant is if we haven't won the war in 12 years, what more can US troops accomplish beyond 2013, 14, 15? So what I would like to add to that is there, um, there is a narrative that is pushed by uh, the pro-Taliban sort of faction and by, um, other people in Washington that says the Taliban doesn't have any beef with America beyond the fact that you're in their backyard. They, there's no ideology in this fight. Go home and we're done. It's over. And, you know, those, those are people who believe that, uh, <laughs> that the Taliban and, and Al-Qaeda's relationship can be questioned and, you know, and pulled apart. And, and, and I would put to that that of all the the people from the Taliban side who've come over or been persuaded to give up arms, not a single one of them has ever publicly renounced Al-Qaeda. Not a single Taliban leader, not the Haqqanis who have more than 30,000 fighters. Um, and given that, if you could explore both what the military could achieve beyond 2013, 14, 15, and also um, you know, why we should care, what is the consequence of coming home? Why does it, why does it matter? Do you want me to take crack of that? Sure. I think the most important thing that we can do post-2014 is to help the Afghan state take greater responsibility for the security of its own country. In practical terms, what that means are three things. First, stand by Afghanistan so that it can negotiate with its regional neighbors from some position of strength, as opposed to simply becoming a victim to its more powerful 
uh, to its more powerful neighbors. Two, we have to help the Afghan state overcome what will be a severe contraction in national GNP after US and international forces cease to engage in security operations post-2014. Nothing works if you do not have an economy that is at least moderately successful. And so anticipating the contraction in Afghan GDP and working to mitigate it, at least until Afghanistan can stand on its feet, is the second important objective. The third important objective is helping the ANSF, the Afghan National Security Forces, essentially succeed in the fight, which is increasingly their own. And so the role that we can play is not for the United States and the international community to take the lead in fighting the adversary. The Afghans want to do that. They're capable of doing it. They're willing to do it. What we need to do is simply provide them the tools so that they can finish the job. We just add, add uh, to a couple of Ashley's comments. Um, I think one way to look at this is if you look at the last major ideological struggle that the US was engaged in, it was against the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. Now, I don't want to draw too many parallels here, but it was, it was a struggle in part against Marxism-Leninism. It was an ideological struggle. It was not just on the battlefields. And if you were to ask yourself in 1960, We've been at this for 15 years after Yalta. Uh, haven't, we, uh, haven't, we, uh, haven't we been doing this long enough, struggling in Africa or struggling in, in Latin America or struggling in Eastern Europe? Imagine if we'd sold out the opposition groups in Poland in the 1960s or 1970s. Look, the, the, the struggle didn't actually end until the late 1980s and early 1990s when groups within States like Poland, Solidarity rose up finally against um, an ideology that the population just could not live with. To shift gears here, and Afghanistan is a good example of this, we are in a struggle with an oppressive ideology. The Taliban vision of Afghanistan, Jabhat al-Nusra's in Syria, they're different in some ways. But in Afghanistan, the groups that are trying to win this one from the opposition side are trying to establish an extreme version of Islam, an, an emirate where the most important ministry is virtue and vice. It's an ideological struggle. And so I would just say, people who want to give up this early on, remember, this one is a generational struggle. It's not one that's going to be measured in months or years. So I would view Afghanistan in a much broader sense. And when you look at what's happening in North Africa, and would you, would you look at what's happening in the Middle East, this is a struggle that is uh, happening on multiple continents. The leadership, though, sits in this particular region, which is why I'm just going to end my comment here by noting that this is what makes this particular theater so critically important, is the leadership structure sits here. Um, right. I, I, I second all of those comments. Um, it is quite true that Mullah Omar uh, never swore allegiance to Osama bin Laden um, because actually it was the other way around. Osama bin Laden swore allegiance to Mullah Omar. Um, as we talk about disaggregating Al Qaeda and the Taliban, uh, it's important to understand that they have been aggregated for two decades. And as you say, there has been, there actually have been arguments about whether to break with Al Qaeda. There was a big argument in the 90s about whether to break with Al Qaeda. Mullah Omar was on one side, Mullah Baradar was on another side. Guess who won? There was a fight when we demanded after 9 11 that they hand over Osama bin Laden. One would think that that would have been a good moment to break with Al Qaeda. Uh, Mullah Omar said, no way. And Jalaluddin Haqqani said, no way. Um, so these are groups that have been fighting together and for each other for a long time. And I know there are people who think that they can see into Mullah Omar's soul and believe that they, uh, you know, if only they could talk to him or Mullah Broader, then we could work this puppy out. But that's, there's no basis in reality for that view. Look, as we talk about, I think Seth's analogy is a very good one. Um, the tide of war is receding. The tide of war is not receding. By any measure, the amount of war in the world today is higher than it was when Barack Obama took office. It's higher than it was when George Bush took office also. 
The tide of war is not receding. The tide of American desire to be involved in war is receding. But now I have to go back to my roots as a Sovietologist and say, we may be tired of war, but war is not tired of us. We can decide that we are going to stop fighting Al-Qaeda, but Al-Qaeda has not decided that it's going to stop trying to attack us. Every day, thousands of Al-Qaeda fighters and leaders wake up and ask themselves what they can do that day to improve their ability to kill Americans. As long as that's true, we do have a dog in this fight. And we can argue about strategies, and we can argue about whether we should do this or that or how many troops. But if we don't proceed from an understanding that that's the world as it actually is, then we are doomed from the standpoint of developing any decent strategy. And lastly, I want to say that we have been talking about two different things that are treated as different but shouldn't be. One is the humanitarian issue in Afghanistan, our promises to the Afghan people, the question of what will happen to Afghan women and so forth, and the other is our security interests. Those are actually, in my view, not easily separable because the United States is not or should not be an amoral actor in the world. We should not be a country, in my view, that just doesn't care if millions of people whom we've promised safety and security in a certain kind of life are suddenly victimized, killed, and treated horribly. We should care about that. And the reflection of the possibility of that kind of care, I think, was in the formation of a new group that was rolled out yesterday that I have the um, pleasure to be a part of, the Alliance in Support of the Afghan People, which has members from the spectrum from uh, me to Gloria Steinem. And both sides are represented in this because it is a recognition that the United States has obligations to its people for their security and has obligations to them also for the ethical nature and morality of our international engagement. And we really can't lose sight of either of those. Thank you very much. I would just close by saying that um, what you have here before you um, is a group of people whose interest in Afghanistan and in the consequences of this transcend politics it isn't about who's in power at any time. This interest is born of a long-term involvement in the region and what each of us has seen and learned from the Afghans, from the Pakistanis, from being on the ground um, there at that time. And the worst part about all of this, I think, is that terrible sense of deja vu, this Charlie Wilson's war. Um, so what I, would, what I would leave you with today is, um, is that I asked the panelists behind the stage you know, not to sugarcoat it and not to give political answers, and I think that you have to respect the, the courage and integrity that you've seen today in, in that the answers you've been given here are truly what these individuals believe, and they have the experience and knowledge in the region for their voices to count. So uh, what's left to us is to, is to hold our government to account. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Wow, that's a uh, uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'll be brief. And, and then we'll all discuss various aspects. And I think we'll have a, a useful Q&A por uh, portion of this as we get into a lot of issues. Let me just highlight a few things. I think um, if you look at polling data, it's probably worth being upfront about this. According to a uh, July poll from 2013, uh, conducted by the Washington Post and ABC News, 28% of Americans believe the war in Afghanistan was worth fighting. Not just is, but was worth fighting. Now that obviously um, differs significantly from October of 2001, the month after the September 11th attacks, when 90% of Americans, 97% of Republicans, and 85% of Democrats supported U.S. military action in Afghanistan. So over the following uh, decade plus, we've seen a huge drop in support about whether we should, should have gone there in the first place. Um, I'm going to argue here, might be somewhat controversially, that, uh, that I still strongly will argue as we peer down the future that U.S. Is, uh, has said that it's going to uh, stop combat operations by December 2014. Still not clear what that means. There hasn't been an announcement about force numbers going to look like. Uh, 
if, if at all, uh, the zero option hangs over um, the uh, future U.S. role. But I'm going to argue that several, four major factors should give one pause in exiting Afghanistan. First is, you wouldn't know it by political statements, but first is <clears throat> Al-Qaeda's global leadership today is still located in this region, in the Af Afghanistan-Pakistan uh, uh, region. It has been weakened by drone strikes, which is, we've seen this week with the Human Rights Watch report and other reports that is a controversial step. It has been weakened, um, but in my view, a civil war or a successful Taliban-led insurgency would almost certainly allow Al-Qaeda back into Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, in more than it is today. I was just there last month along the border, and we'll say up front, uh, there is still a presence of terrorists, including Al-Qaeda fighters, along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Uh, virtually everyone I spoke to that's involved in targeting them, uh, people that I worked with in the past, have said uh, they will be there after 2014. In fact, the concern in some areas of the East with an organization called the Haqqani Network is, uh, is that they may be there in larger numbers. So point one is that the global leadership is still there, and, uh, and there are a number of, of uh, Sunni jihadist groups in this region uh, that are not going away. Some of, one, some of them, including the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan, uh, put an SUV in Times Square. So another Lashkar-e Taiba, which is also fighting in Afghanistan, um, uh, conducted a major terrorist attack in Mumbai. So my first point is there's still a terrorism issue. Second. A civil war or a successful Taliban-led insurgency would deal, in my view, a severe blow to human rights, including women's rights in this region. Um, the Taliban remain deeply opposed to women's rights and would like, likely reverse progress in a country that has experienced an extraordinary improvement in the number of female business owners, government officials, primary, secondary, and university students. I think you'd, you'd see a major uh, backlash. Third, a burgeoning war in this region uh, would likely increase instability uh, with India, Pakistan, <coughs> Iran, and Russia, all of which, and I'm going to add China to this, either have nuclear weapons or, at least with the Iranian case, have a nuclear program. Uh, so there's a concern about regional instability, particularly between Pakistan and India. And finally, let me just conclude by saying a U.S. exit from this country will likely foster a perception about U.S. reliability. And when you look at Al-Qaeda statements recently, I'm going to leave you with one final thought. An American exit from Afghanistan, we've already seen this in the jihadist networks, if it were to happen, it's not necessarily clear, would likely be viewed and would be trumpeted by extremist groups, including Al-Qaeda, as their most important victory since the departure of Soviet forces from Afghanistan in 1989. That is a very, very, very dangerous legacy that we have to think very carefully about. Now, we could talk about how to proceed later, but let me just leave you with that thought. Okay, Dr. Tellis, you are, you're nodding your head at a few points there, and I know that the nuclear issue is one that you've spent a lot of time on. So, can you take the floor? Sure, I'd be happy to start by actually emphasizing a point that <coughs> Seth just made which is that the American and international project in Afghanistan over the last seven years has actually been far more successful than people give either us or the Afghans credit for. Remember, this is a country that went through several decades of violent war, where every state and societal institution was essentially destroyed. And when you look at Afghanistan today, what you actually have is a constitutional regime of the kind that was simply impossible to conceive at the high tide of Soviet occupation and in the painful years that went after. So you're now looking at a country that actually has the potential to build on a structure that, if improved and if invested in, can actually provide more opportunities for all Afghans, including those who are currently opposing the state. So just recognizing that this has been a fundamental success in terms of an ability to put in place a structure where all you had before was an anarchy, 
is something that you cannot overlook. I would just interrupt you there to say that Americans don't care about that because their leaders keep telling them that the Afghans are corrupt and dishonest, unreliable, that Karzai is an unreliable partner, and they're never given a reason to believe in anything that the U.S. has achieved in Afghanistan. Well, I think the facts refute that on the face of it. As Seth pointed out, <coughs> development <coughs> indicators in <coughs> Afghanistan today are better than they've been in a long time. And the simple reality is corruption is endemic to all third world societies. Afghanistan is by no means either particularly egregious or particularly unique. The question is not whether one needs to bail out of Afghanistan because it has the maladies of an underdeveloped state, but whether we can persist consistently in Afghanistan, not necessarily for the sake of the Afghans alone, but because it fundamentally comports with our own interests. And what are those interests? Those interests come back to the same interests that we went into Afghanistan to begin with in 2001. And that is, there is still an unresolved security problem in Afghanistan that directly affects the well-being of the American people and those of our allies. So is there anyone on this panel who would disagree with that, Dr. Kagan? Not me, for sure. Um, <clears throat> I think that as we, as we think about Afghanistan and why it matters, um, there is a tendency to treat it in isolation, to uh, have this discussion as though the discussion we were having is whether we should put troops into Afghanistan or not. Um, and when people say it's not worth it for us to be there, why should we go into Afghanistan when we're not going into Yemen or any of the other places where there's Al-Qaeda, um, the problem is that you start from reality where you actually are, and the reality where we actually are is that we have been in Afghanistan, and we have made an enormous sacrifice, an enormous effort in Afghanistan, and as Ashley said, quite rightly, um, we've made an enormous amount of progress. There is an Afghan national security force that is getting after our enemies, and they are getting after our enemies. They are the, the people that the Afghan national security force is taking it to are Al-Qaeda and their allies. Um, they're doing that increasingly, but <clears throat> they will not be ready uh, in 2014 to take over that responsibility without any American assistance because they weren't designed to be ready in 2014 for that role, any more than the Iraqi security forces were designed to be ready in 2012 to take over responsibility for Iraq without any These assistance. These are domestic political deadlines. These Domestic American, American These are, political deadlines. Well, deadline. in the case of Iraq, it was a little more complicated. There was a negotiated uh, deadline with the Iraq. Welcome back. For anyone just joining us, my name is Chris Griffin. I am the executive director at the Foreign Policy Initiative. FPI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that makes the case for American leadership and engagement in the world. The theme of this year's forum, which is FPI's fifth, is Will America Lead? Our next panel, the first of the afternoon, will speak directly to this question, because there's nowhere in the world perhaps right now where the question of American leadership is more important than Afghanistan. And what we really want to focus on in this conversation is, as the title says, Afghanistan 2014, what are the stakes? We could not have more expert speakers to address this question. The great challenges that the Afghan people, along with their international and American partners, will face in the coming year than Seth Jones, Frederick Kagan, and Ashley tell us. This conversation will be moderated by Laura Logan, Ms. Logan is a full-time correspondent for 60 Minutes. She was previously CBS News Chief Foreign, Co Foreign Correspondent, and her award-winning work has included frontline reporting from Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as interviews with former Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf, General John Abizaid, and Medal of Honor winner Salvatore Gunta. I want to quickly remind those watching on C-SPAN to please join the conversation using the hashtag FBI Forum. For those in the audience, please submit your questions with the cards on the tables. Uh, drop them off in the question box in the center of the room. Thank you again for joining us today. And Laura, please ask you to take over. Welcome, everybody. I think you've had, uh, you've had a long morning already. So we're going to liven it up a little bit on the stage here. You, um, if, anyone, if anyone still cares about Afghanistan, I'm assuming that's why you're here and you're going to pay full attention to what these gentlemen have to say. Um, it struck me when I was doing my research and preparation for today that um, what is interesting about the, the panel that you have in front of you is that Afghanistan is well represented and, and, and uh, 
and each of these individuals have a good knowledge of the situation on the ground there, especially historically over time. Um, everyone has a depth of reporting in the region. But what you also have is, um, you know, it is individuals who are very familiar and specialists in all the issues that are at stake. Seth Jones has worked with uh, Special Operations Command. He has a, a, a very close view of the military strategy. Counterterrorism is one of his expertise, fields of expertise. Um, you also have Dr. Ashley Tellis, who has been a specialist on Asia for years, and particularly India. He can, he can bring in the Indian perspective here because, um, as we had a brief conversation earlier, India has a significant role to play in Afghanistan, and, and it has really not been at the forefront of, of the U.S. strategy in that region over the last decade. And, of course, Dr. Kagan is, Kagan is um, best known for his work in Iraq, although you know, Seth and Dr. Kagan have both uh, been at RAND Corporation. You can read Seth in uh, the New York Times. You can read one of his many books in the Graveyard of Empires and, and others. So um, what you have here today is an opportunity um, to remind ourselves what's at stake in Afghanistan and why the U.S. should care. And um, I was, you know, the first question I was given was to ask what was at stake, but um, I want to put it in, a, I think, a much more pointed way. And that is to say, uh, over the last couple of years, the term war has become unpopular in Washington. Um, in fact, from the CIA to the White House, um, it has been made very clear that even using the term war for war on terror was probably a mistake. And um, I am very conscious of the fact that every other day I get another casualty report from the battlefield in Afghanistan where U.S. soldiers are still dying. And as far as they know, they're still fighting a war. And in that environment, you have an Afghan election that's coming up. You have the United States um, pulling out of Afghanistan to a large degree. And you have a nation that has completely lost interest in what's going on over there and is not given a reason to care by any of its leaders. So I would put to the panel, and we, we picked Seth behind the stage. We picked him to be our first victim. Um, so he's going to begin this conversation. And, um, and I have interviewed him before. I can promise you he's not boring. It is given both treasure and blood. We can talk about how well it was used and, and what the right strategies were. I mean, I'll be the first one to say big mistakes were made over that time period. But we looked Afghans in the eye in 2001 and said, we will be committed to reducing, if not eliminating, terrorist groups operating from this region, and we will stay until that uh, objective is met. What we've now said is, sure, that objective hasn't been met, but we're still leaving anyway. And the blame has largely been placed then on the Karzai government. Now, I'll, I'll also say very bluntly that uh, there have been massive corruption problems within the government, as, as there have been in any government in South Asia. There have been challenges with building uh, national security apparatus. There have been uh, corruption problems in the U.S. dealing with uh, contracts in Afghanistan. Uh, but I would say, first and foremost, not just to the, the Afghan people, but can we look the American people in the eye and say that we have um, reached a point in Afghanistan where the American homeland is safe for now and in the foreseeable future? And I think the evidence, uh, as I have spoken to operators on the ground from the region last month, suggests no, not at all. Uh, there are foreign fighters that are continuing to come into camps in the region. There is still some active plotting. And the leader of this organization, Ayman al-Zawahri, is still headquartered in this area. So this organization is not dead by any means. Or decimated. Or decimated. It is not on the verge of strategic defeat, uh, as, as some would argue. Okay, Fred's going to follow up on that, and then Ashley, I'll come back to you, okay? Yeah, I mean, on the contrary, if you look at any uh, portrayal of where Al-Qaeda is today globally, it, is, it has a much larger footprint and a much more um, advanced organization now than it did in 2001 and also than it did in 2009. 
Um, it's, it's in, it is absolutely unjustifiable to talk about this organization as having been decimated. But I want to just follow up on the issue of betraying the Afghan people because it's very important. That's not just a question of American honor, although I think that is very important. Nor is it just a question of, of will other people believe in us, which is also, especially after the Syria debacle, extremely important. And Egypt. And Egypt and many, many other things, um, and probably Iran. But it is very important for a practical reason. What is Al-Qaeda? Al-Qaeda is not just a terrorist organization. It sees itself as the vanguard of an insurgency in the Muslim world. It's a political revolutionary movement. That's right. And what is our ideal end state? Our ideal end state is that the Muslim world defeat this insurgency, not only reject it, but defeat it. In order for that to happen, we need people in Muslim countries where there are Al-Qaeda to stand up and fight against Al-Qaeda. They have done that in Iraq, and they have done that in Afghanistan. And I know that Seth and I, anyway, and I don't know about Ashley, have been on the ground and spoken with Iraqis and Afghans standing up to fight against al-Qaeda who look us in the eye and say, are you going to be there with us when these guys come back and try to kill our families? And the fact that in Iraq, the answer has been heck no, and that we're now having a discussion in Afghanistan about going to zero, which would make the answer no undermines the best possible outcome we could have in this struggle, which is Muslim people rising up against this hateful ideology on their own. So, actually, just before I come to you, Seth, a man you and I both know, Amrullah Saleh, the former spy chief of Afghanistan, told me years ago when I asked him when it was the first signs of America withdrawing were, were in the air, and I asked him about that. And he said to me, he said, Afghanistan is a small, poor third world nation. We do not have any illusions about who we are. And we do not think for one moment that we can influence the United States. He said, but I will tell you this. I was fighting these people long before you came to my country. These mountains were here before you. These rivers were here. And they will continue to flow after you have gone. He said, Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban, Osama bin Laden, these are truly forces of darkness and they cannot engender... Iraqis ...that originated with us, but it was a negotiated deadline with the Iraqis. In the case of Afghanistan, it also originated with us, but it's become an international uh, deadline that the Afghans hold us to. But yes, they're arbitrary deadlines, and they weren't tied to uh, the situation on the ground. Um, and I bring up Iraq here, recognizing how painful a topic it is, um, but just because something's painful doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it if it's important. And it is very important, because as people are talking about the zero option in Afghanistan, and the path to zero, the model for that is Iraq. And the line that you largely get out of the administration uh, leakers who talk about this stuff is that, well, Iraq worked out pretty well, so there's no reason why we shouldn't do that in Afghanistan. And the problem is that Iraq is a catastrophe, which has also gone unreported. And you have now an Al-Qaeda in Iraq franchise that is back to the, le it's the level of car bombing that it was conducting at the height of the surge in 2007 before the violence came down. That has all happened since American forces withdrew. And the administration's line is that's not really Al-Qaeda and we don't need to worry about it. And besides that, it's in a place called Iraq and we don't believe in that. It's not really Al-Qaeda even though they call themselves Al-Qaeda and they <laughs> believe in Al-Qaeda and they fly the flag of Al-Qaeda and they yes. fight for Al-Qaeda. They release statements in the name of Al-Qaeda. Exactly. And they have, <clears throat> they set up as Islamic Emirates and they fly uh, Al-Qaeda flags and they have foreign fighters. So we'll just leaders. ignore everything they have to say about right. who they are. Exactly. And everything we know about who they actually are. Um, because what the administration is trying to do, and this is a very, very important point, I think. What the administration is trying to do is to define the threat from Al-Qaeda down to be only those individuals who were actually either involved in the 9-11 attacks or part of the organization at the time of the 9-11 attacks. And if you want a picture in the White House somewhere, a poster that has the faces of all of those people on it with X's crossed through the ones we've taken down, with at the bottom, done, when we've gotten through it, I think that's pretty much what administration strategy is. The problem is that the world has changed since 9-11 and Al-Qaeda has changed since 9-11, although in some important respects it hasn't, of course. Well, I would say to you that, for example, that's not even good enough because you have people, you know, like Sufyan Ben Kumu, who was uh, a Guantanamo Bay detainee who's been with Osama bin Laden since the 80s, who drove, who worked for him in Sudan, who went with him from Afghanistan to Sudan, back to Afghanistan. And when he was handed over back to the Libyans, 
He was released by Gaddafi for the revolution. He founded Ansar al-Sharia in Derna in the east of Libya, and we no longer call him al-Qaeda. <laughs> right. He's one of the original al-Qaeda members, but we want to now say he's an affiliate or a linked group or some kind of associated group. So even having you know, al-Qaeda pedigree that goes back 30, 40 years isn't enough to still get you called al-Qaeda today in Washington. Right. And so, and we spend too much of our time thinking about who is currently planning to attack the United States, and not enough time thinking about what capabilities does the global al-Qaeda movement have to attack the United States over the long term, and what are we doing to address those capabilities? And the spread of that ideology. And the spread of it. So, okay, let's bring it back to Afghanistan. Seth, I want to uh, put two things to you in regard to Afghanistan. I think you and I were both there from the beginning, and we remember what people today in America seem to have forgotten, which is the promises the United States made mm. when they came into Afghanistan. And to me, this is a very important point because it speaks to integrity and honor and loyalty and, um, and the nature of being a good ally. And this was raised a little bit by you. The reason I find it so significant is that I think when we think of the United States and what it's meant to stand for and represent, um, it's very hard to look Afghans in the eye today and say that we are honorable people who keep our word because we've lost interest in keeping our word. And we've successfully blamed the Afghans for that domestically in the United States, but the Afghans are not fooled just because you wear, you know, dish, you know, sort of traditional robes and you don't speak any English and you live in a, a mud compound doesn't mean you don't get it. You know when you've been betrayed or let down, and that is pretty much how a large majority of Afghans feel, which only makes Americans more resentful because they think, oh, all that blood, all that treasure, how did we end up in this position where Afghans feel betrayed and we feel that we wasted our effort? Well, it's a very good point. Um, the U.S. has promised much, and it has given much.